So, welcome to the, uh, the final session of the day. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, uh, Marcus Zerlach, who will talk about the uh, uh, LHC High Luminosity Project. Marcus. Thanks for that. Does the mic work already? Can you hear me back there? No, I don't think it is. Is it switched off? All right. Now I can hear it works. So many thanks for the introduction and welcome to this last part of uh, today's session. So it's my pleasure to, uh, uh, now that we've heard in the morning a lot about the mentioning of the HLLC upgrade project. So I will try to clarify and explain you a bit what indeed we hope to be able to do uh, for your community and maybe what also LHC, uh, the upgrade project cannot do. So uh, as was already mentioned, my name is Salad Marcus. I'm here as the deputy project leader. And of course, what I present today is, is not my work entirely. So I have uh, allowed myself to take material from a couple of colleagues. Will you put it in presentation mode if it doesn't seem to work? Sorry for that. Maybe if you close and start again. All right, excellent. Now it seems to work. Okay. So the, the, this is actually a usual slide I, I intend to show in the beginning, but I think it doesn't quite do justice to this beautiful place that the organizers have brought us to. So, all right. All right, now it works. So I decided to change. And I would also like to thank the organizers for bringing us to this place. As I mentioned before, for me, it's also the first in-person presentation since one and a half years. So it's excellent uh, being out here. All right, so what I've prepared for this afternoon is a little bit different from the talks that you have heard during the day. It's a rather technical talk. So I will talk more about the HLLC upgrade goals. I said what the performance reach of the machine will be, and I think how we can continue fueling uh, your exciting research. So for that, I have to recall, recall a little bit what the LHC was really designed for and what it actually can do and why we need the HLLC upgrade goals. Then I'll talk a little bit about the involved key challenges of the upgrade, many of which are technological. Uh, I will also recall that, of course, the HL upgrade is not only a CERN project, it has become, at that scale, a really truly international project. And I will finish with a couple of slides on the current project planning. So when do we uh, intend to deploy the project and when will the, uh, pro the upgrade project be installed? And I will finish with the intended performance ramp up. Now, uh, as I said, uh, I'm sorry, the slide seems a bit distorted, but I will try to, to walk you through. So, of course, as you know, the LHC, to a large extent, was also built for the Higgs discovery. Not only, of course, there is many other questions that are still out there that we also hope to still pull uh, from the LHC data. But we expected the Higgs to be in an energy range of above 1 TV. This is why the design energy of the LHC at the time was chosen to be 7 TV. The second important design param parameter if you build an accelerator is, of course, instantaneous luminosity. For the rare events we want to see, we decided to have a luminosity of 10 to the 34. And the last ingredient is, of course, the uh, accumulated data, which we call the integrated luminosity. And the LHC was designed in its lifetime that normally is, was intended to finish at, in the years of 2025 to 2030 to be 300 inverse femtobar. bar. Now, this last, by the first two are really uh, design parameters of the machine and when you do the accelerator design. The last one is not entirely. It will, of course, depend on the first two. But there is also the way on how we actually deal with beam lifetime, the turnaround of the machine, how quickly we can bring back uh, uh, the machine from one field to the other place uh, into all of that. Now, what was achieved in the LHC uh, in the first two running periods? So you see the numbers over there. Uh, I think, as all of you very well know, the data set is a bit mixed. So the first operational run was done at somewhat lower energy of three and a half and four TV. Run two was entirely done at six, uh, six and a half TV. 
So this is, of course, beam energy, not the center of mass in the experiment. So for that, you would have to double these, these numbers. We have been doing really well in terms of luminosity. So we have exceeded the design goal by a factor of two, reaching two times 10 to the 34. And also when it comes to integrated luminosity, we're perfectly on track in reaching uh, the goal of 300 inverse femtobahn. Today, we have accumulated almost 200 with still one operational running period to go. So this is a picture you might have already seen throughout the, the workshop. So we have seven operational years uh, behind us, 2010 to 2018. Uh, so run one from 2010 to 2012, the second one from 15 to 18. Uh, normally the first year is always what we call a commissioning year. So we're not really yet in plain physics production. This is also why the accumulated data is quite low. But you see that we managed to steadily increase, uh, reaching in 2018 already in a yearly production of close to 70 inverse femtobahn. And this, I think, is also a, a goal that we can easily keep up for the last running period. Now, if you put all of that together, and if you don't account for the first one that was uh, done at somewhat lower energies, we have accumulated 106 inverse femtobahn at 13 TV, because, of course, the higher the energy, the more interesting the data is for you. We are fairly confident that 17 inverse femtobahn per year, and we still have at least three years of operation ahead of us, is at hand. The peak luminosity we will be able to reproduce. So if you project all of that, we believe that by the end of one three, we should be easily capable of accumulating uh, something above 350 inverse femtobahn. Now, of course, all of that has led to the Higgs discovery. This you know very well, but there is many, many more questions of which we have heard partially during the day that are still out there. Uh, a better definition of the Higgs properties or better measurements, answering questions if there's more than one Higgs beyond standard model physics that we'll also hear later on, dark matter and dark energy. And for all of that, of course, we need more data and more statistics. So the high Lumi goal in very simple terms was to increase the LHC data volume by another order of magnitude by a factor of 10. But of course, the LHC was not designed to achieve that. And there's many, many uh, limitations in the existing LHC that have to be overcome in order to achieve that goal. So that starts with very simple things like the cryogenic cooling of what we call the triplet magnets. So this is not what you presently refer to as, as triplets. This is simply because uh, we have three final focusing magnets. It has a lot to do with radiation damage to the components of the accelerator, which is also the case for the experiments, by the way. Uh, and one important factor is around machine efficiency, but I will come back to that a bit. So there is clearly a need for an upgrade. So going a little bit more in detail, so the main objective of the high luminosity upgrade is really to determine and build a hardware configuration, but also a set of beam parameters that will allow the LHC to reach the following targets. So first of all, we have to extend the operational lifetime of the machine. As I said, the current LHC is built to last until 2025, 2030. So we want to go at least all the way up to 2040, which will also bridge the gap to an eventual new uh, HEP machine that will be built, either linear or circular, as we have already heard a little bit this morning. So we also have to devise beam parameters and operation scenarios to reach that. So we want to enable a total integrated luminosity of 3,000 inverse femtobahn. This implies per year 250 inverse femtobahn. So this is basically what we collected in the six or seven years that are behind us. And uh, while doing that, we still have to uh, uh, keep what is called the pileup, so the, the number of simultaneous events in the detectors at a reasonable level, because otherwise the data analysis gets uh, very, very complicated for, for everyone. So these are, of course, uh, uh, very tightly linked. And of course, keeping the pileup very low is, is important. And our strategy of doing that is that we intend to operate with level luminosity. And I will just show you in one slide afterwards what is meant with that. Really sorry about the format. This didn't look like that on my side. So the project as such, even though I will show you that many of the R&D activities, they started very well before that. They started already in the year 2000, actually, for some of the magnet projects. The project was formally approved by the CERN Council only in June 2016, which means as of this point, it's integrated in the midterm plan, also in terms of budget and manpower uh, at CERN. But now we have uh, come quite a long way, and I will show you a lot of pictures and examples afterwards what already has happened. For many of the hardware production, we're actually entering the series production of equipment, heat, magnets, craft cavities, uh, much of the work is very, very well advanced. So just a word on the operational scenario. So as I mentioned, we have to try keeping the pileup in the experiments at a, at a digestible level. 
And on that plot, you see uh, uh, typically the uh, peak luminosity plotted over the duration of a typical physics field. So normally an LHC field typically lasts between eight to 12 hours, unless it's aborted prematurely by uh, an equipment failure or beam losses. So you see the LHC nominal uh, uh, value, which is one times 10 to the 34. With the HL LHC upgrades, theoretically in the beginning of the field, you could go as far as two times 10 to the 34 in terms of peak luminosity. And you might see luminosity peaks actually in the experiments when we start bringing the beams into collision. But of course, this we cannot do continuously because this would mean pileups all the way up to 200. So the strategy that we do is that we stretch it out by using different leveling techniques, either with beta star, with crossing angle, to keep for a longer duration uh, the number of collisions constant. And then only after eight, 10 hours, the, uh, because of the beam lifetime going down and, and the, uh, the beam intensity going down, then typically the peak luminosity will also dry off. We have another weapon still in, 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 in the sleeve, which is the crab cavities that I will talk a little bit later that will allow us to further extend uh, this leveling time. Now, how do we reach the HLLC performance? I will not talk about all the ingredients, but I will try to cover at least the main four. The first one of them we actually already have behind us. So this is uh, what we call the LHC injector upgrade. I only have two or three slides to quickly go through that because high luminosity also critically depends on a brief performance from its injector complex. Another one is that we have to deal with these higher intensity beams. They have quite some implications on radiation levels, on beam instabilities that we have to tackle. There is also a lot of new hardware development, so we need to reach lower beta stars. So this is a much lower beam size in the points of the experiment to get up the number of collisions. I will show you a couple of examples of new triplet magnets, but also separation dipoles that have to be uh, designed and produced for that. And we also have to deal with the crossing angle compensation. So let's start with the first one, the beam from the injectors. So I think this picture certainly all of you have seen before. So of course, we all, always only talk about the LHC, but the beams are actually at CERN at least produced by a whole uh, sequence of what we call the injector chain. In case of the proton chain, it used to be uh, the particles are generated and, and first accelerated in the old Linux 2. At least this was the case up to and including one 2. And then we have three further machines, the booster, the PS, the SPS, before the beams eventually end up in the LHC. So the ion program is similar. We have another uh, Linux, so Linux 3, then it goes through Lear, the PS, again, the SPS, before being injected in the LHC. And also this injector complex was not really uh, made or designed and fit to serve uh, the HLLHC performance. So in this past long shutdown two, as we call it, which came after the end of run two, we had to go through a very intense and widespread upgrade of the entire injector complex to actually provide the beams that HLLHC is requiring at the input of the LHC. And if you compare that, you see here the nominal beam parameters for LHC. So this is the bunch population, which is roughly one times 10 to the 11. So this we have to more or less double. And also the emittance, so the transversal size of the, of the beams has to go down. So basically, we will have much higher brightness beams already at the entry of uh, the LHC. So then, in order to overcome that, uh, many of the machines, I will not go in detail to that, this becomes very technical. But the workhorse of the LHC, which is 25 nanosecond space beams between the different uh, bunches, uh, are limited by space charge in almost the entire injector chain. You had to go through a very big upgrade of the RF power in the SPS and also tackle longitudinal instabilities. And even the backup scenario has certain limitations in terms of space charge and uh, instabilities. So this is uh, only a tentative list of things that had to be done. You might have heard that Linux 2 was entirely replaced by a new machine. So we have a new Linux. But for the first time, we actually do H minus injections into the booster at somewhat higher energies. We also had to increase the energy at the exit of the booster to overcome uh, instabilities, uh, necessarily, of course, increase the injection to PS and go through a very big power upgrade. And all of that was very successfully completed. And we're in these days commissioning these new high brightness beams throughout the injector chain. So dealing with the regime. Um, so of course, once you have these very high brightness beams at the entrance of the machine, you also have to be able to digest them in the LHC because they bring also a, a couple of problems along with them. First of them, uh, the first one of them is the beam stability. So we have to upgrade the entire 
collimation system. So these are the absorbers that are placed all around the machine to intercept the natural losses and also the collision losses that we will have. Uh, we also have uh, to keep a close eye on the beam lifetime because the LHC is a superconducting machine. So superconducting machines and beam losses, they don't go very well together. So we also have to avoid uh, magnet quenches in cases of lost files. We also have to look at machine protection. Our beams already now, but even more so with high luminosity, they store an impressive amount of energy. And uh, a misguided beam can actually uh, cause quite some local damage to equipment that might be very costly and lengthy to repair. Plus, uh, this is often forgotten, but machine availability, in particular for high luminosity, is something that is extremely important. I will show you in a second the plot why that is. And we used to have in the past quite some issues with what we call radiation to electronics. So this is basically the effect of ionizing radiation that you always have in and around the accelerator on electronic systems, power converter controls, quench detection systems. They create single event upsets that will perturb and lead to false positives and stops of your machine. And if you look at what we actually are targeting for, so here you see a plot. This is actually the outcome of the Monte Carlo simulation where you see the performance reach of high luminosity LHC. So you see the reach in terms of integrated luminosity. The further we go to the, to the bottom left, the more luminosity you get out of your machine. And what you see on the X and Y scale, so on the, on the X scale, you have the average fault time. So this basically is a measure on how quickly we can resolve faults. If you have a fault, the power converter stop in the machine, how quickly can our teams intervene or how much can we actually solve remotely? to very quickly get back into stable beams and produce physics again. So the further you, the shorter your average fall time, the, the better your physics output. And on the Y scale, you see the machine failure rate. So this basically means how often is the field prematurely aborted by an equipment failure or by beam losses. And again, the further down, the further down you go, that means the less frequent you have failures in your machine, the higher the output. And you see that even though the LHC was performing already very, very well, and there is uh, the performance reach if we would actually run HLLHC with the 2012 availability. But you see that even from there, in order to reach the high luminosity target luminosity, we have to further work on the availability of our entire accelerators. So how do we do that? So we have to deal, of course, with the losses that inevitably exist in the machine and that travel around. So for that, we have to go through a, a major upgrade of the collimation system. So this is just a sketch of the uh, eightfold symmetry of the LHC with our uh, collimator regions uh, centralized in 0 0.7, 0 0.3. And we have already more than 100 collimators and absorbers all installed all around the machine to protect the superconducting elements that we have in the machine. And this starts with passive absorbers very close to the experiments, in particular Atlas and CMS that are high luminosity regions. So we have uh, uh, these big metal blocks that uh, intercept the neutrals and also charge particles coming out of the experiments. Because in the end, uh, a large fraction of the collision projects, they will actually not stay in the experiment, but they will go out of the experiment at very low angles and be lost in terms of radiation or ionizing radiation all around the machine. So we also have to go through and design completely new layout for what we call tertiary collimators. So these protect uh, our inner triplet magnets, or the final focusing magnets. We have a whole set of low impedance, high robustness secondary collimators, and they are there to uh, uh, bring down the problems and tackle the problems with the instabilities. We have particular uh, off momentum particle interceptions that we intend to install in the dispersion suppressor region, so in the cold part of the machine. And the same is going to happen for uh, Alice as well, that is a dedicated ion experiment. And all in all, there is almost 60 new of these quite complex elements that have to be produced by LS3 and, and are part of the HLLC baseline today. Another uh, measure that you can take if you have problems with radiation is of course taking out the equipment of the tunnel. Now this sounds obvious and this you can do for some of the elements, of course, not for magnets, cavities that have to stay on the beam line, but for all of the ancillary equipment, the power converter, protection systems, everything uh, that you can avoid putting close to the beam lines where you have ionizing radiation, you should do. So very early on in the design of high luminosity, and this decision was actually taken uh, already back in 2014 or 15, it was decided that we will do exactly that and that we will actually build new underground areas to uh, take away as far as possible much of the infrastructure away from the beam lines. 
And what you see in this picture is actually the existing, well, now even those are excavated, but let's say the old LHC tunnel with the Atlas or CMS cavern in light gray. And everything that is here, maybe dark gray or blue, was actually new underground areas that have been constructed in order to install power converters, cryogenics, uh, uh, RF power supplies for all the equipment that is installed along the beam line. And of course, this is uh, not only on one side, but actually the, the symmetric thing is also existing on the other side. So this was a very big undertaking and the progress of that has been uh, quite fantastic because despite of all the COVID restrictions, we managed to, to stick to the plan. And all the underground civil engineering work was completed during the long shutdown too, because uh, doing uh, very heavy mechanical excavation work is of course not something that is compatible with the operation of uh, um, an experiment very close by. So we uh, intentionally wanted to finish that work during LSP. And I will just show you a couple of pictures on how good the progress actually was. So this is the example of point one. So this is uh, Atlas. Of course, there is underground areas, but there is also surface buildings that have to be constructed on top. So everything that you see in blue is completely excavated and actually ready for the installation of infrastructures. The same thing is true for the surface buildings. Now, for those of you that have very good eyes, you might see that there is only a very few red stretches. So these, these very thin vertical cores. So this one actually will only be done in LS3 because with the existing machine still being installed, we didn't dare drilling vertically onto the ceiling of the machine because otherwise it would have been the risk that we destroy the equipment that is today installed in the tunnel. So these, will only, these connections will only happen actually at the beginning of the long shot. So just to show you a couple of pictures of how that looks like. So this is from the very early days. And you see that this is quite some heavy work that was ongoing underground. But very quickly, they started to resemble more and more underground areas. Uh, and this was actually upon the occasion of the very first breakthrough between the new galleries and the existing LHC infrastructures. And some of you might remember these people. So this is Lucio Rossi, the former HLLC project leader. This is Freddy Baudry. This is our current DG Fabiola and Oliver Bruning, who is leading the Hydomi project today. So going on, you see that uh, with time, all of these underground areas, they're really taking shape to the point where we are today. That all of that is really ready to start receiving the first technical infrastructure. So here you see the shaft coming down from the surface to the new underground areas. You see the very long galleries and you see that we have started installing the first metallic platforms that will very soon receive the first cryogenic and ventilation equipment. So looking on the surface, uh, maybe a little bit less impressive or more, more common. So here you see that we have started casting the, the different slabs and the walls went up, uh, the ceiling came on top. And today the buildings are actually being uh, delivered as we speak. And these surface buildings, they will serve primarily for infrastructure related to cooling, cryogenics and electricity. All of that is looking very good. And of course, it's a very nice concept to evacuate as, as much equipment as you can. And you see actually how dense even this new underground area will be populated. But of course, if you have to power equipment and magnets in a tunnel that require 18 kiloamps of DC current, you also have to find technical solutions on how to bring over these 100, 120 meters such high current density. So there is also new technology that had to be developed for that. And I only show you, oops. I think it You want me to go through or I try to quickly get there. All right, don't worry. Almost there. Okay. No?
Okay. Otherwise, I can try to play it on my computer if that is better. The file is quite large, it might be because of that. Try to go directly to the slide and then play from there. It should be 23. Yes, this one. Mm. Very sorry for that. I hope they'll do better with the actual upgrade. We could do, but then you will have to switch these the slides manually. Okay. All right. Okay. Now it seems to work. Mm. Mm. All right. Okay, sorry for that. So um, I was mentioning that indeed we also have to develop technology in order to carry these very high currents from these new underground areas to the elements that actually need them. And one of the very interesting R&D projects that were done was the development of a new type of superconducting link. So we have them already even in today's LHC, but at a much smaller scale. So this was a development done based on a magnesium diboride cable. So this is the actual material of the superconductor. You see here a cross section of the cable that is uh, roughly 10 centimeters in, in diameter. So it's a multi-conductor cable that actually goes into a, a flexible cryostat that you see here that then can be put on a big spool. And this is actually what then will be lowered into the tunnel and then be installed uh, into this trench where it has to go in order to connect from the new underground areas to the tunnel. And this demonstrator was successfully installed and tested already and one of the test facilities at CERN demonstrating that such a cable can carry the required currents of almost 20,000 amps uh, in each of the conductors. So this is how it looks like. There is a bit of zoom. So here you see a better picture of this flexible cryostat, which of course for installation is very convenient to have to be put. But of course there is quite some ancillaries for all the cryogenic and electrical connections that are needed for that. And here you see that this superconducting link, we actually managed to, to operate not in liquid helium anymore, but this is gaseous helium that is used for the cooling at 30 Kelvin. This is a big advantage of magnesium diboride. And you see that we managed in this cable to do these cycles of 18 kiloamps and also for smaller conductors up to two kiloamps. So that was the, a very interesting and, and very good success. Now, uh, another ingredient to the upgrade is reaching smaller beam sizes in the experiment. So this is what we denominate as Peter star. And there is the, the high luminosity goal is uh, a factor of three or four smaller than what we can reach with the LHC today. But all of that also needs new magnet technologies. And I will try to explain you why that is. So for those of you that have seen, this is an image of uh, the current, we also call them triplet magnet because there's three optical quadrupoles that are needed for the final focusing of the beams towards the experiment. So here it is, uh, you see roughly the transversal beam size. Uh, and here in the middle, you would have the actual interaction point in the, mid in, in the experiment. So now what actually happens, as I mentioned before, much of the collision products, they actually will exit the, uh, the experiment. They will travel along the beam pipe and they will start impacting on the first uh, equipment that is in their path. And if you actually look at the radiation, the ionizing radiation that some of these elements, typically the ones closest to the experiment will receive, you see here plotted on top, the radiation dose that these equipments in the current or prospected for the 300 inverse femtobound for the LHC will receive. And you see that of course, as a function of, of, the, of the optics uh, along, the, along the path, it's not necessarily the first element, but here at the front phase of the second quadrupole, you'll reach uh, doses up to 30 megagrams. And this is really at the limit what you can design today in terms of resins, in terms of insulation materials inside your, your magnets. So if you go beyond that, that means if you would continue running the current LHC, these magnets, they would simply break, most likely with electrical failures of insulation because of uh, the material used today. 
So the only thing we can do is indeed to replace these existing triplet magnets with a more radiation tolerant system, and that means shielding. Uh, that means that we have to put tungsten inserts even inside uh, the beam chambers of these, uh, these magnets. This, of course, needs uh, space. So that means uh, in order to go to the 150 millimeters of diameters that we need for HLLHC compared to the 70 that we have in the current LHC, it means that we have to also go up in the peak field of the coil. So in the current triplet magnets, they can reach something like 8 Tesla in the current coils. For HLLHC, we will need peak fields all the way up to 12 Tesla. Uh, there is, of course, uh, magnet designs that are already existing for that. And this is one of the R&D efforts that was done since uh, 2000 with our American colleagues. So this is US Lab. And here you see the cross-section of the new inner triplet magnet design that was done at the time. Now, of course, this doesn't really stop there. So here you have a comparison of this last series of magnets uh, just before the experiments Atlas and CMS, how they look like in the current LHC, how they will look like for high luminosity LHC. You can already see that, as I mentioned before, the quadrupole magnets will be longer and stronger. There will also be a, a much bigger corrector package for higher order corrections. Plus, we also have to replace uh, the separation and recombination dipole D, uh, D1 that used to be a normal conducting one with a superconducting one simply to recover uh, the length and the space that, the, that was needed by the quadruple magnets. Now, I mentioned that these new types of magnets, they will use niobium-3 tin. And this actually is the new technology that probably all the future head machines have to go towards. And the reason for that is that uh, niobium tie that is and used to be the workhorse for almost all the superconducting machines is simply limited in terms of the peak field that you can reach for uh, the current densities that you need. So this line shows more or less the working point of LHC. So we reached 8.3 Tesla at, at uh, decent critical current densities. But if you have to go to 12, 15, maybe 16 Tesla, as it will be required for high luminosity, but also future machines like FCC, we need to embark into different uh, superconducting uh, technologies. And the only one that we have available today that we know how to actually produce in, in a serious way and on an industrial scale is niobium 3 tin. And here you see the new working point for high luminosity. Anything beyond that, the only way to go will be uh, high temperature superconductors like IPCO and others. But these are very, very difficult materials that at least today we don't really know how to, uh, how to master yet for uh, industrial production. So niobium 3 tie, uh, there has been a whole R&D program on that. We are, uh, and I will show you some examples that we reached today with magnets 11 to 12 Tesla. 16 Tesla will be needed for uh, potential future HEP machines. This is a material that exists already quite widely. Uh, MRI is using almost 20 tons per year. ETA will be a very big client of that, but it comes at a considerably higher cost than niobium tie, and it is a brittle material. And this is something that we see now in magnet testing that is actually a technology that we still have to learn how to fully master. And HTS will be needed for anything if ever we need magnetic fields all the way up to 20 Tesla, but also already there is quite some ongoing r &D. And this will put actually the, the high luminosity magnets quite in the evolution of uh, the past machine. So you see that HLLHC will really be the succession of uh, initial superconducting magnets we have seen in Fevatron, Hera, Rick, and at the end LHC. So high luminosity will bring us there. Any future machine will probably have to be able to exceed uh, 15 or 16 Tesla in terms of magnetics design. And as I said, the, the turnaround time of these technologies is very considerable. The R&D for the high luminosity LHC already started uh, around the year 2000 with very early models. And only 50 to 20 years later, we we're actually able to master them and uh, install them as planned in 2025. So now, just very quickly, a couple that, of course, this didn't stay with the R&D. So this is a couple of pictures of the very first models that were built for the inner triplet magnet. So this is a very short magnet still. But you see that this one reached already with only 10, 15 quenches, the, the nominally even ultimate current. So this one was performing very well. There was a whole succession of different models. I said that the R&D program was very long. Uh, and I'm very happy to show that uh, already in 2020, we actually had the first long uh, full-scale magnet tested at uh, uh, the test station of our American colleagues. And also at CERN, we have already produced uh, the first you know, triplet quadrupole that will also then be installed in the LHC tunnel as of 2025. 
So we're really now entering the phase of series production for all of these equipment. In 2020, actually not only one, but already a second magnet passed successfully the tests uh, last year. Today, we have even two more magnets. So that means that already one full uh, IP side of, of the LHC uh, we can fully equip. And this is a program that will continue uh, as of today full speed. So the first term prototypes were tested in 2021, and the first series magnets has been finished and is, is awaiting cold testing most likely in the beginning of, of next year. And this is just to demonstrate the, the really excellent performance as well of the long magnets. So what you see here is the training plots of the superconducting magnets. So here you see the number of training trenches that it will need to reach the nominal and eventually ultimate current. The less training trenches it needs, normally the better and the, the more margins you have with your magnets. And you see that within five to 10 magnets, all of these first series magnets, they have reached the nominal or ultimate current level. So this is a very, very good result. Now, very quickly, last topic on crossing angle compensation, because that is uh, one additional R&D line that uh, we pursued from the beginning. So this is how the insertion region around the experiments looks like from the machine point of view. So uh, of course we cannot have uh, both beams traveling in the same beam type. So we have a, a set of separation recombination dipoles that will bring them in a common beam type just before the final focusing magnets. And this part uh, where the experiment sits is actually only 50 meters long. And uh, what we of course would like to do in the middle of uh, the collision point is that we operate with a maximum of number of protons. So that means a large number of punches, which led to the design of this 25 nanosecond spacing. But this also actually leads to a whole number of unwanted collisions. And this has to do with the crossing angle because we have to actually uh, cross in the same beam pipe the two, the two beams, beam one and beam two. And even though they will nicely collide in the, in the center uh, for head-on collisions, also these punches that are actually physically apart, they will have um, unwanted collisions and they will actually impact each other. And this will lead to nonlinear fields from what we call long-range beam-beam interaction. And this certainly is something that has to be avoided. So the measure that we have to do against that is that, of course, you want to make this crossing angle as big as possible in order to increase the separation of uh, the bunches which are not in the middle of the, of the experiment. This, however, has uh, uh, an undesirable side effect. That means that the overlap of the bunches when they collide is not ideal anymore. And you actually lose uh, in terms of luminosity because of what is called the geometric factor. Now for the uh, nominal and today's LHC, the effect is not yet that big because the beam size or the beta star was, was fairly modest still, one could say compared to high luminosity LHC. So the loss would only be between 15 or 20%. If you look at where the HLLHC target lies, this is of course already much more severe and you would lose up to 70 or 80% of uh, the instantaneous luminosity because of the geometric factor. So what we can do against that, and that is quite an ingenious uh, idea, is that we actually take the bunches and just before we start colliding them, we will tilt them. So we will tilt them transversely. So that means you give to the head and to the tail of the bunch uh, electromagnetic kick in order for them to, to tilt slightly backwards. And if they then go like that through the crossing angle, they will perfectly collide head on in the middle of the experiment. So this is, uh, uh, but for in order to achieve this, what we call uh, crabbing, you have to be able to create an oscillating transverse electric field that kicks, as said, the head and the tail of the bunches in opposite direction. And of course, once you exit the IP, you have to do it in the inverse sense. So this serves as a mitigation to this effect of the crossing angle at the IP. And, uh, uh, but it also requires, uh, as said, new designs of uh, equipment that I will show you just in the next slide. And of course, also the space constraints in an area that is already very dense is something we have to consider. So these are uh, the developments for the devices that we did for that purpose, and we call them crab cavities that you might have heard about. Again, this was a major R&D program that started many, many years ago. Initially, there were three or four different variants of cavities considered. Now we are concentrating on two designs for the installation for the uh, final deployment to the tunnel. And they're called the RF dipole and the double quarter wave. And here you already see uh, bare cavities as they have been produced. 
but we also went already a step beyond that. So the first uh, RFD uh, dipole cavity has already been addressed and tested. So that means uh, the power couplers get installed, the higher order mode couplers get installed. And you see that we have reached uh, deflecting voltages all the way up to five megavolt, which are unprecedented and which by far exceed the operational specification, which is only in the region of three megavolt. So we're very confident that this uh, will actually work. Of course, the scrubbing has never been shown for proton beams. We also wanted to try that out on a proton beam itself. So we have taken that, that a step further. So one of the cavities uh, at the time an RFD cavity was taken. It was jacketed. Uh, all the power couplers and the, uh, the antennas were installed. They were put in their cryostat, connected to a cryogenic system. And all of that was put in a test station in the SPS. So that was the only place where we could test it with uh, proton beams. It was not possible to be inserted that easily in the LHC. And here you see how this installation took place. So it was installed in what we call a bypass. So that means for normal operation, the crab cavity is actually out of the beam and the beam passes through just a normal vacuum chamber. And for dedicated beam development periods, all of this table is moving inside and like that we can uh, test out the, the operation of these crab cavity modules. And this has been done at the end of run two, so in 2018, very successfully. And this, plan to, this test station will be reused for the double quarter wave as of the beginning of run three which as you know, will happen in the beginning of 2023. And with, during these test periods, so a, a lot of these, what we call machine development periods were conducted in the SPS and we were actually capable of showing for the first time crabbing with proton beams. So here you see an image. If the crab cavity is off, you have the perfectly uh, elliptic shaped uh, and distributed bunch. And here you see that the, the tail and the, uh, the head of the bunch, they are tilted uh, transversely. So this is also very, very good and very encouraging results. A couple of last slides before I get to the deployment and the performance ramp up. So uh, as I mentioned already throughout the slides, HLLHC is really not only a certain project, it's really a worldwide collaboration. Our American colleagues have joined us very early on, already in the year 2000. But as you see, many other uh, colleagues and institutes uh, are also taking, picking up work packages. So our Japanese colleague, they're doing the V1 design. There is contributions from China, from Canada, the Russians. So all of that is very, very much appreciated. And I think uh, an exciting opportunity for the entire project. And if you try to put that on uh, the installation that we have, so you see that this is, of course, a very exciting opportunity to have all of these different collaborators and countries on board. But it's, of course, also a, a somewhat a challenge, a logistic challenge and an organizational challenge in order to coordinate all of that. And I just use, again, the crab cavity, but this I could easily also do with many other systems that will be installed in the LHC tunnel, is that the logistics behind can become very complex. And if I just take one of the example of the crab cavities for the double quarter waves, they're actually produced, the cavities themselves, in Germany. The couplers, they come, or the cold magnetic shields come from the UK, the couplers and antenna from Russia, then they go back to the UK for assembly. They come back to CERN or Sweden for cold testing before being installed. And it's the same story for the RFD cryo modules. The cavities are done in Italy, shipped to the States for uh, installation of the cold magnetic shields into the helium vessel, cryo starting done in Canada before they get back to CERN for installation. But still, all of that is, is very well underway, and we're actually preparing ourselves for the next major milestone, which is which we call the inner triplet string. So this is the installation in one of our test facilities of an entire stretch of this final focusing magnet. So we will install series magnets uh, for these paddle pole magnets in what we call SM18. And this important milestone is going to start uh, commissioning in 2023. And this will be the opportunity that before we install this complex system in the machine, that we really can test uh, not only individual components, but the operation of the system as a whole. All the interfaces in terms of ele electric, vacuum, cryogenic, electrical system performance, protection, but also installation and commissioning procedures. And this has already proven very useful for the LHC uh, 20 years ago. All right, so before I conclude a couple of slides on the deployment plan, so I hope I'm, I'm well in time, I should manage. So I think most of you, you know what is already behind us. So that includes two very successful operational runs, 2010 to 2012. 
Then we just finished end of 2018 uh, run two. Now we're coming out of what we call uh, long shutdown two. That as I mentioned before, has brought the, the entire upgrade of the uh, injector complex. Now the LHC is almost back in operation. So we're in full swing with what we call hardware commissioning. So this is the, uh, the cold checkout of all the different equipments uh, to start up the machine again. And we're actually planning a first beam test at injection energy only in October. So this is going to happen in the second or third week of October. But then uh, the nominal startup, because the experiments, they still have some upgrade work to finish, will only be around March 2022, which I think we have heard uh, earlier today already. So this brings us then uh, at the verge of the start of run three. Today, we're still planning for three full years of operation all the way up to the end of 2024. And then we'll, uh, and this will then mark the start of the long shutdown three, which is really the start date for installation of all the upgrades I have been showing you in the past slides. Today, we estimate that uh, also on the machine side, we will need two and a half years to disinstall everything and install all the upgrades that we have to do in the, uh, in the LHC tunnel. And then hopefully we'll resume operation uh, in the middle or towards the end of 2027. So if you now try to predict a bit the performance ramp up, because as we have seen it already for today's LHC, we, we cannot expect that we have nominal performance from day one of the machine. This is more or less the prediction that we can make uh, as of today. So as you see, uh, we will still take uh, the first two years. We will not expect to go immediately to uh, the full bunch intensity. So we'll probably stay around 1.7, 1.8, perhaps 10 to 11 photons per bunch. Also, this will also allow us not immediately to have to go to the full crossing angle of 500 microrad, but to stay slightly lower. And also in terms of beta star, we'll be uh, a little bit more conservative, start at 30 centimeters, and then only over the years gradually start decreasing uh, beta star, as we have done it also in the, in the past two running periods. And this will allow us to keep the pile up as it is uh, shown here below the target of 140. Uh, with time, as I said, we, we, the machine would be capable to exceed even the, uh, the guidelines of the experiments, but this, uh, we still have to see how we will operate the station limit after that. And if you put that a little bit in a more digestible form, so this is, uh, I think, almost my last slide. It shows now uh, the estimate in terms of integrated luminosity of what we will be able to accumulate with the LHC. So today we are here uh, at the end of uh, the first two running periods. We have uh, roughly 190 inverse femtobarn accumulated. The next three years should bring us, as I mentioned earlier, to something like 300, 350 inverse femtobarn. Then we have the intensity and performance ramp up that I mentioned before that should bring us in, in the region of 1000 inverse femtobarn at the end of, of run four. And then run five will take us to 2000 and run six, uh, slightly even above the goal of 3000 inverse femtobarn. Okay. So as a very last slide, I just want to very quickly show you if you're interested in, in more details, I just put you the references there of uh, the final technical design report that just has been published uh, end of last year. So this one is available online. So please don't hesitate to have a look. And with this, I am done. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Marcus. That's very, very impressive uh, description. Thanks, of, thanks to the NHC uh, team as well. Done amazing work over the years. So, questions for Marcus over there. Uh, I don't know anything about accelerators. Forgive the very stupid question, but since you're already increasing the magnetic field, couldn't you have increased the energy while keeping the previous luminosity? Well, increasing the energy, yes, of course, theoretically is possible, but then also all the magnets that are installed, and in particular the dipole magnets that we have in the machine today, we know that they will be the limiting factor. And this was actually the reason why also in the first two running periods, we haven't been able to that easily increase the energy. And this is also the reason why even now in run three, uh, I actually missed to say it, but the, the energy for run three has now been set. So it will actually be 13.6 uh, TV center of mass. 
And this is because uh, the current dipoles, they um, experience difficulties in retraining. So we don't manage uh, for these very long dipole chains. We have circuits where we have 150 of these magnets in series, and it takes a lot of time. And we actually already, unfortunately, damaged two of these magnets that after thermal cycles that we always have to do after a long shutdown, they are not that easy to get back to the nominal performance. And this is what is the limiting factor in terms of pushing further the energy. Then indeed, even if they have been designed initially to go to what we call ultimate energy, which would be 7.5 TV, uh, this is a target that we know by experience now is very difficult to reach. But the magnets are the limiting factor of why we can't go beyond the current design energy. Of course, there is uh, ideas of, of building a high energy LHC. But this will only go also through replacing a very large number of uh, the magnets that we have today installed all around the circumference. What I was talking about now is, is only uh, two times 400 meters of the machine. But we have magnets installed all around the 30, 30 kilometers of the machine. So we have more than 1,200 of these dipole magnets, which today are the limiting factor of the energy. Okay, thanks. And it's actually that what is the limitation of the 13.6. Um, well, two questions really. You mentioned uh, both 3,000 and 4,000 inverse femme turbines as the target. Uh, can you yes. clarify between? Yes, I and can clarify. My question is uh, before you answer that, <clears throat> this is really an unfair question, but um, what what is the earliest possible time? when a decision could be reached positively to build the FCC and what is the earliest possible time the FCC could conceivably take data? Okay. okay, I will try to answer both questions. So first I'll try to clarify. So you asked indeed, I didn't really speak about the goal of 4,000 inverse femtobahn, but indeed normally uh, 3,000 inverse femtobahn. So this is what is the nominal design goal of high luminosity LHC. So this is a target that we uh, commit that we can deliver. The machine, however, is built to even perform slightly beyond that by using engineering margins that we have built into the design of the machines. So all the magnets and everything will be designed to be also reach uh, more accumulated data that, than that. So that can either go by an extension of the LFC lifetime beyond 2040, to maybe make the bridge to an FCC that comes afterwards, or it can go by quick, quicker ramping up the, uh, the performance of the machine. So let's put it like that. All the equipment will be designed compatible with the goal of 4,000. However, the management will today commit that high luminosity LHC in the time all the way to 2040 will deliver 3,000 inverse femtobahns. But as we see today with the LHC, if everything goes well, we will deliver more, of course, than the 3,000. Now to come to your second question, so FCC, I think this very much depends on, on what variant of FCC you, uh, you're going to build. I think CERN indeed, uh, this morning we heard uh, uh, wishes that maybe we should go towards a linear machine. CERN today is rather putting its focus on indeed a circular machine being FCC. And very likely it's taking the direction of FCC EE. So first an electron machine, build the tunnel, get the machine installed, and then maybe at a much later stage, uh, potentially build as well the Hadron machine. Now for the exact timelines of when FCC EE could be built, um, I cannot really tell you, but uh, even FCC will need still quite some consequent magnet design, machine designs. So I think before 2045, 50, it's at least for me personally difficult to imagine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the next speaker, uh, is this a remote talk, the next one? Yes. Okay, the next speaker is, uh, is uh, Isabella Oceano, uh, speaking from Lecce, I guess. Um, yes, you're right. The right dark matter with the Padme experiment. 
my mind. So um, I cannot share because the, you are sharing, the, so. the organizer, you have 20 minutes. Is that, is that uh, sort of 17 plus three or something? Minutes? Sorry? 18 plus two. Okay, so I'll give you a five minute warning. Can you see the full screen? Where is uh, Isabella? Yes. Guess you can talk. Uh, I'm sorry again to hear you. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 We can hear you, but uh, can't you hear me? Yes. No. Yes. Good. Very good. Okay. So uh, why don't why? Where do you start? I'll give you a five minute warning. Yeah, we saw your slides, we don't see them anymore. Yeah. Sorry? Okay, we see them again. Okay, I can start. Yes, please. Okay. Thanks. So, hi everyone. Uh, so, we'll talk about the searching for the light of matter with the Padme experiment. Uh, first of all, let's start to introduce the physical motivation. Uh, if we assume that the visible matter is the only constituent of the universe, this is not enough to justify some astrophysical and cosmological phenomena like the galactic rotation curves, the bullet clusters, and the cosmic microwave background, and so on. Uh, the most the motivating uh, model no, is uh, the, the super the system. System. So, so, uh, I, I'm here, my, my voice, <laughs> uh, which imply um, electro, uh, a dark matter candidate mm -hmm. electro weak scale. Uh, however, uh, several constraints was put uh, on these models. So uh, for these reasons, uh, we will explore other, uh, um, other uh, models that introduce the dark matter. One of these is the introduction of new uh, gauge symmetry, UD1. Consequentially, a new uh, massive gauge boson A prime uh, called dark photon. Uh, this model is very interesting uh, because uh, uh, dark photon can weak interact uh, with the standard model particles through the kinetic mixing coefficient epsilon. Epsilon is one of the two uh, parameters of these models, along with the mass of the A prime. Uh, the production mechanism um, that uh, produces the A prime is the astralung that is uh, um, very similar to the bremstralung, uh, but here we uh, are producing the dark photon. Uh, the other, uh, we had, uh, we can have other two uh, production mechanism uh, if we use a, a positron beam that is the annihilation production. So we have an annihilation of uh, one positron and one electron and uh, the resonant production. Uh, the decay mode of the A prime depends on the mass hierarchy. In fact, if the mass of the A prime is higher than two times the mass of the dark matter, it will decay in dark matter particles. Otherwise, the A prime will decay in standard model particles. Based on this mass hierarchy, uh, we have the search of the A prime. In fact, we can have the visible decay and the invisible decay search. 
Um, in this slide, I'm showing you uh, the limits on uh, the parameter space of, of this model in the visible and invisible decay. On the top of this slide, um, I've reported uh, the limits that the experiment put on this model. Uh, on the bottom, uh, the same limits are reported in gray and uh, in um, the, the color lines are the future experiments, so the future limits that uh, the experiment will put on these models for uh, both the uh, search of the prime. So let's talk about the Padme experiment. Uh, the Padme experiment is a very young experiment uh, that is looking for the dark photon in the annihilation production. So we have a pos positron of the beam that is impinging on an um, electron of a target and uh, will produce uh, the uh, standard model particle coupled with the, the dark photon one. The um, technique that uh, we will use to uh, detect uh, the um, dark photon is the missing mass, since uh, we know very well uh, the uh, for momentum of the other particles. Since Padme uses a positron beam of 550 MeV, the mass that we can reach of the A prime is lower than 23.7 MeV and we need of a statistic of uh, uh, four times 10 to 13 positron on target. As I said, Padme uses a positron beam coming from the LINAC of the Laboratory Nazionale di Frascati and impinging on a, an active diamond target. Then a dipole magnet allowed to bend the charged particle produced in the interaction and a VEDO system uh, allow to detect them uh, in order to reject the background. The standard model photon should be detected by the calorimeter system composed by the main calorimeter equal um, that has a central square doll. Behind it, there is the small angle calorimeter sac. The signature of the uh, dark of the new physics should be a single photon in the whole experiment. Uh, so we are looking for a peak in the missing mass spectrum. Of course, we have backgrounds. In uh, particular, we have Bremsstrahlung and annihilation. For the Bremsstrahlung, we have uh, a single positron on the positron veto and uh, a photon in the calorimeter system. Uh, a positron inefficiency should give, should populate the higher values in the missing mass spectrum. Um, for the annihilation, we, uh, the annihilation in two photons. Uh, so this kind of background is very easy to reject thanks to the fact that the two photons in the final state are correlated in energy in polar, in polar angle. However, a photon inefficiency should give a missing mass value that peaked at uh, zero MeV squared. And then we have the annihilation in three photons. This kind of background is very difficult to reject, to reject due to the fact that we lost the symmetry. And uh, in case of photon inefficiency, we can have uh, uh, any value in the missing mass spectrum. Uh, so uh, we um, took data starting for, uh, from October 2018 and uh, we collect with the first run up to 5 times 10 to 12 positron on target. However, this, uh, uh, this data collected in the first run um, is affected by a huge background. So several calibration runs was made to perform the, uh, of course, the uh, detector response, but also to um, reduce the background, uh, the background induced uh, by the beam. In this uh, best configuration, we took the second run um, in September 2020, where we collect uh, five times uh, 10 to 12 positron on target. Uh, the data analysis, of course, should start from the standard model physics. In particular, uh, we studied the Bremsstrahlung and the annihilation physics channel. 
the first one, uh, for the first one, I'm uh, reporting you the Bremstrahlung uh, positron profile on the positron veto uh, after the background subtraction. Um, in the plot on the left is represented the data uh, with the, the black dots. And then we add uh, uh, in uh, the red and black uh, solid lines, uh, there is the Monte Carlo simulation with the two uh, kind of background uh, hypotheses. And then uh, the green solid line uh, is uh, the um, analytical uh, uh, prediction in the full screen uh, um, hypothesis. As you can see, there is uh, a good agreement between uh, the data collected and the uh, uh, prediction uh, of the simulation and the analytical formula. On the, the right, so there is the um, two photon annihilation process. In particular, on the plot, I'm showing you the annihilation spectrum. In the standard run condition, um, uh, reporting with uh, the red uh, dots and uh, with, a, with a special uh, data um, taking condition that allow us to predict uh, the background, the beam related background. Uh, as you can see uh, in the run two, the um, improving of the um, beam transportation allow us to have a very good uh, signal on background ration. In fact, here uh, you can see that the background is very negligible. Uh, the analysis is ongoing and uh, we will extract the cross-section measurement for the first time at uh, this uh, scale energy. So um, the future search in, uh, in Padme. Uh, Padme is uh, an experiment that can uh, serve that, that can investigate uh, other dark matter candidates. In particular, the axon light particle, so a um, pseudo scalar mediator between the dark matter and the standard model particles. Um, the ALP. Uh, should be produced in the annihilation of the positron with the electron and uh, it will decay in a visible channels so we can have two photons in the final state or only charged particles in the final state. In both the case, Padme uh, can uh, measure the, the mass of the final state and can uh, probe this, uh, this hypothesis. Of course, the ALP can decay in uh, invisible, so in uh, dark matter uh, candidates um, particles. And in this uh, case, we have the same signature of the uh, dark photon one. So uh, studying the missing mass, we can probe uh, both uh, the hypotheses. Another interesting uh, uh, dark matter candidate that uh, Padme can uh, investigate is the dark Higgs. The dark Higgs can be produced coupled with the dark photon uh, through the annihilation. The final state of this process that can be visible in uh, the Padme experiment is the um, six leptons in uh, the final state. Uh, thanks to the fact that we had um, a huge number of uh, particles in the final state that uh, will be uh, detected using the VETO system, um, we can reduce a lot the background. We can, of course, have the same final state um, from the, um, the, the standard model uh, interaction. Um, but if we uh, study the uh, acceptance of the experiment, uh, the ratio between the signal, so the dark photon and the background um, allow us to uh, detect the dark X. Uh, the last uh, um, candidate that uh, um, Padme can probe is the X17 boson. Uh, as you know, the atomic collaboration see an anomaly in um, uh, the beryllium and the helium distributions with a mass of 17 MeV. 
So we can probe this uh, hypothesis if it is uh, a new, um, a new particles and uh, it will produce by the annihilation and uh, the final state should be a couple of uh, um, charged particles. So a new run was planned to test uh, this, uh, this hypothesis and we start to take data in, uh, we start to uh, take data in January 2022. So in conclusion, PADME is a big target mismax experiment that uh, is looking for the- This is going to be a five minute warning, but I see you've gone, gone to your conclusion. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I can go on maybe. Yeah, carry on, carry on to your computer slide. Okay. Uh, so um, um, uh, Padme is uh, model independent uh, and uh, we can probe uh, several uh, dark matter candidates. Um, we acquire two uh, run, so the first one and the second one, uh, and uh, it's visible that in the second one we have a very good uh, background, uh, um, beam background in the experiment, so it's very, very low. And uh, in this uh, uh, condition, we uh, collect an half of the planned statistic. Uh, the standard model uh, um, physics, uh, uh, the analysis on the standard model channels is, on, is uh, going on. And uh, in particular, uh, the extraction of the cross-section of the uh, annihilation to photons um, should, is, uh, of course, uh, an interesting uh, result. Uh, but is a step toward the um, dark photon analysis. So new runs are planned to uh, test other dark matter uh, hypotheses. Thank you. So can you hear me, uh, Isabella? So, some questions for Isabella. Seems not. I mean, I'll, I'll ask the, the obvious question. What, what, what are the, the plans for the future running of the, uh, of the experiment? Maybe uh, I, I can tell you very well, but maybe uh, are you um, asking me the plans for the experiment? Can you confirm? Yeah, yes. How, how, yeah. How, much more, how many more protons on target do you expect over the lifetime? I can't understand. I'm, I'm really sorry for this, but uh, the plan of the experiment is to, um, to, to take data for this uh, X17 uh, boson. Uh, so to, to try to probe uh, this uh, boson existence. So we start to took data in January 22, uh, 2022, and uh, uh, we uh, will uh, took data for uh, uh, three months. So uh, we should uh, um, see the quality of the beam because uh, we had to reduce the energy of the beam. So the, the, our uh, great problem is that the experiment is uh, uh, using this kind of uh, beam for the first time. So uh, the wall run one was used to um, improve the beam quality and the beam transportation. So, so we have to study the background related uh, of the beam at uh, uh, the new energy. So it's very, very low. It's lower than 300 MeV. Uh, so uh, we are planning, however, to take data for three months. Okay, thank you very much. So no more questions. We thank Isabella again for a very interesting talk. I hope you could hear everybody clapping then. Um, okay, so shall we come to our, our next speaker? Is that... Oh, good. So next speaker, um, exotics and beyond the standard mod model particles in Atlas and CMS. And it's uh, anna Catherine Horovort. I'm, so, I'm sorry if I pronounced that, that incorrectly.
Is it already good or not? Yeah. So now, uh, okay. So I have to hold it myself. <laughs> okay. Is it okay? Not okay? No, I, I was, I was just good. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Also for me, it's the first time in like two years to to be in person on a conference. And yeah, it's uh, it's my pleasure to present today exotics and BSM results in Atlas and CMS. So uh, well, I will take you on on a journey um, through the sea of big mysteries in the search for uh, for the Terra Incognita which is, um, well, whatever questions are unanswered with the standard model. So we have a lot of, of theories that, uh, that give us some predictions, but actually we have very few observational hints. So there is a lot of boats in this sea around, uh, one of which is um, the, uh, the two big general purpose experiments, Atlas and CMS. And uh, we have a nice big data set that is the uh, Rantube data set roughly 140 inverse femtoband of PP collision data at 13 GB. And with that, we are performing a very rich and very active uh, exotic search program. Um, for those who are tired, um, a little spoiler, there are new, no, um, no new physics found. So um, all I can show today is how we are pushing mass limits and the precision of these searches. Um, yeah, and also, as you see, this is like the public overview slides of, uh, of the limits that are set by Atlas and CMS. There is a lot of searches going on. I will not be able to cover them all. I did a selection of results uh, with the focus on recent and for run two analyses. Um, you can see the full results on the public web pages of Atlas and CMS. And also in this spot, I will always put the links to uh, the actual searches that I'm showing. There's two more talks in this conference. One is on uh, SUSE and one is on dark matter searches in Atlas and CMS. And uh, they will happen a bit later in this week. Um, mainly the only bulletin that we have currently is the, uh, the BM anomalies where it seems like locked and flavor universality is violated in B2SL transitions. Um, something very nice, um, but still, even if this manifests, we're not 100% sure what, what type of models is actually uh, realized. The laptop quarks are very popular, um, but clearly we need more searches to, to pinpoint uh, a bit better what, what type of new physics is around. So um, in the exotic search program, we have uh, related um, searches for this, uh, searching for laptop quarks, having vector particles, there is um, B2S uh, contact interaction search, and also a few more searches that are actually related. So let's get started with the laptop quarks. Um, these are predicted in many theories and guts theories, composite Higgs models, and so on. Um, we are looking for laptop quarks either produced in pairs or uh, singly. And then look for the decay products, which is, of course, always a quark in the lepton, where searches um, in the third generation only and with mixed generation final states. And we're looking for scalar and vector lepton quarks. 
So on this slide, you're seeing switches for third generation laptop cooks. There is, um, this is a summary plot of Atlas searches for uh, scalar laptop cooks. This is down type, the same exists for uh, up type laptop cooks. Um, all of these switches um, exclude laptop cooks up to about 1.3 TV. Uh, nice to see is that we can also um, reinterpret SUSE results um, in, in these models. There is also a search for vector vector quarks, uh, roughly 1.7 TV is excluded. When else has combined um, single and pair production um, channels and have also set um, limits on the scalar of the quarks around 1 TV and on the vector of the quarks uh, similar to Atlas around 1.7 TV. Moving on to um, to the lower generations, CMS has a first generation on laptop uh, quark search, um, setting limits in the range of up to two TV. Atlas has a search for mixed first and uh, second generation scale on laptop quarks, as well as another search um, for third generation mixing with either the uh, first or second generation. Also, um, Atlas has performed a contact interaction search um, for BSLL contact interactions at high masses. Uh, I've put here some of the um, final diagrams that they are searching for. So in their final states, they will always have a dileptone pair, E plus E minus or E plus E minus, and then there could be um, another B or a light quark in the uh, final state. So here are two of their um, signal regions. So the signal region is actually what starts here at this uh, axis. Um, what they do is um, they search for an excess of a, on the cumulative MLL distribution. So actually they're adding up the bins from the right to the left. It seems like there's a little bit of deviations, but nothing is really statistically uh, significant. And so um, they are setting mass limits somewhere in the range up to either two or three TV and uh, TV. Moving on to the heavy gauge bosons, um, there are searches for charged and neutral um, heavy gauge bosons. Um, let's start with the charged ones. So W prime um, leptonic decays are looked for. The signature here is basically that in the transverse plane, you have the leptin back to back to uh, the missing energy or missing uh, momentum from the neutrino. So what we to do is um, we we'll take the transverse mass um, distributions and look for an excess. This is how this would look like um, in a power surge. And the, red, um, the solid lines here are two different uh, signal models for uh, W prime. Um, now the search by, by CMS with electrons and neurons in the final state, nothing found and with a uh, limit set when the MT up to about three and a half TV. And Atlas has done a similar search with tires in the final state going up to nearly three TV. The mm, W plan can also decay into quarks. We have searches over um, top and bottom final states. Um, where those are actually searched for in an electronic final state. That means um, because this is a heavy particle, this is quite boosted. So we have this being basically a large jet, and we exploit uh, the jet substructure in order to uh, actually identify our uh, tops and base. Our limits are set um, for W primes with right and left hand kinetic key by um, searching for an excess in the MTB spectrum. So this is um, how this looks like in CMS, for example, um, where you have here signal models with two or three TV. And again, in, uh, in both experiments, no excess was found. Moving on to W prime decays, two and W and the Higgs. Um, here we we'll exploit uh, the W decay being leptonic and the Higgs decaying to two bins because this has the highest quantum ratio. Um, again, with the highly boosted, so we have collimated decay products. Um, we, will, we use large objects um, to identify the Higgs and um, make use of the substructure. I think of me visit um, dissolved, so by Higgs, um, and objects dissolved and a much larger object. Um, 
own experiments um, use B tracking methods for the subjects um, to, to identify this. And in the end, what is fitted is again uh, the mass distribution of the WH. And yeah, those experiments have seen no mixes. There's also neutral gauge bosons we can search for. Um, they can be carried either to the revenues, that is the CMS search, uh, and the 2 w final state, which is um, performed semi electronically. They can be carried on um, the jets, this is a CMS search on uh, digest resonance. They can be carried um, again to jets, but uh, big jets here, and that was search on this final state. And then um, there has been also an atlas search um, in which they, in which they search for what they call a lepton universality violating Z prime, which um, exclusively couples to base. So here the Z prime is um, produced in association with the baby bar work, um, baby bar work pair. And so we have four Bs in the final state here, but also there, nothing was found. Moving on to the dilepton ratios. Um, in CMS, there is a search for resonant and non-resonant dilepton final states with high masses. So in one way, they actually search for resonance on the dilepton um, mass spectrum and set limits, for instance, on uh, Z prime models. But they have also done um, um, they have also investigated the ratio of um, dynamic over dielectron pairs. Um, and in comparison with the, uh, with the standard model predictions, so Monte Carlo, um, they see a very good agreement up to about 1.5 TV. But actually, and that is very interesting, um, there is a dip in this, uh, in this plot at about 1.8 TV. And that goes in the same direction as the uh, B anomalies. But of course, um, this is not yet uh, statistically significant, but of course, it's something very interesting to follow up. In Atlas, um, we have a different lepton uh, ratio that we're investigating, and here it is about E plus me minus over E minus me plus. So it is about the charges of an E minus a e mu pair. In principle, in the standard model, this should be one. At the LHC, it's not because, well, you start with two protons, so we produce more likely Ws. And if you have double plus jet events, it's easier to fake an electron from a jet than to fake a muon. And so this would be, in the end, a bit smaller than one in the LHC. But nothing stops BSM physics from um, actually producing, producing an excess here. Um, the, the analysis group has investigated this in RPV Soci and the group models. That is the ratio part, no real excess found anywhere. So uh, they have also set ex exclusion limits on the models they investigated. Moving on to vector like quarks, it's a big, um, big topic also in exotics, um, as they appear in many models and as they are potentially solving the fine tuning problem. So, um, there could be a vector like top, um, capital T, or a vector like bottom, and these are arranged with the a bit more exotic X and Y VLQs in singlets, doublets, and triplets. Um, this slide is on pair production. Um, they can be pair produced in strong interactions. And we have um, searches in CMS for uh, the vector like B with Zs or um, Hxs in the final state, where both of them decay um, temporarily. In Atlas, um, there are searches for vector like top and B, where um, they require the Z in there to, to decay electronically. Um, and in both cases, um, they have set limits on the masses and branching ratios. Electron like quarks can also be produced singly by the exchange of an electric gauge boson. We have a CMS search um, for electron like tops, um, where the becomes into invisible neutrinos. So it's very important here the top tagging uh, techniques that they perform, and they do uh, a measurement with the endpoint of the um, of the transverse mass uh, spectrum. And this is um, um, vector like this search um, from single production, where um, they exploit uh, the the Higgs to um, the voice. 
and also have the vector like T uh, search, where um, they have um, either V decaying to uh, quarks or uh, a Higgs decaying to, to these. And finally, in principle, you can combine all these uh, theories and have a heavy gauge boson that decays to vector like quarks. So this is a, a CMS search, um, also in an anhydronic final state. And they are putting uh, with this limits on the W prime mass. Another a very active area is searches for a CSO. Um, we are searching for type 3 CSO and um, looking for um, heavy charged or on neutral leptins. So these um, these decay to standard model bosons and leptons on neutrinos. So we will have final states with two, three or more um, leptons. I'm putting here um, a few examples of Feynman diagrams on top of the slide. So I'm asking some multi-lepton switch with uh, three or more uh, leptons in the final state with or without a um, missing PT. And um, yeah, so what they are fitting is uh, these kinematic uh, distributions that is the uh, sum of the lepton transverse momenta and the missing transverse momentum. Um, what was the limits? Um, they, are, they are excluding masses of roughly up to 900 GV. Um, in Atlas, we have two dedicated switches, one with two leptons in the final state and one with three more leptons in the final state. And also here, um, there is similar exclusion limits as in the CMS experiment. Also, the Higgs can have exotic decays because although it looks very standard model like, actually, um, the uncertainties are still quite big. And so, there could be um, up to 10% of the branching fraction of the Higgs going to some BSM particles. There's searches for um, Higgs going to remove particles either in the inner detector. So, this gives us um, rather short mean proper lifetimes that we can test. This is the Atlas search on this, and this is the corresponding CMS search. And then it's also looking for um, that's in the uh, neon spectrometer, so it's not quite made for this, but they can actually do um, the first vertex searches with the neon spectrometer, and this um, gives us uh, access to higher uh, lifetimes. The same is done in uh, CMS. They are also looking um, for uh, long of particles in the and neon detectors. And finally, Atlas has done a reinterpretation of um, monojet plus uh, PT mid search. So that means um, the, um, the long lived particles actually escaped undetected in the detector. Moving on, um, there is, for the first time in the LHC, um, there are trijet and tribosome searches performed by CMS. So uh, trijet. Um, is interpreted as a calisocline gluons. So the calisocline gluon goes uh, to a radian and a gluon and has a three gluon final state. That means um, it's searching for double resonance, ones of the three uh, jets and ones of the two jets from the uh, radian. Around here, most of this is very boosted as we expect um, the calisocline gluon to be heavy. So uh, they're exploiting set jet substructure to set the limits. And this is the limit plot. Um, everything uh, left of this uh, line is excluded. Um, another search that I've performed is for dibosons. So this is a calisocline excited massive W, also um, decaying um, by a radian uh, resonance into three Ws. These are um, the final states they are uh, investigating. So it's either a lepton plus a large object or an all hydronic final state. Um, then here are the mass distributions that are fitted, and one switches for an excess like this. Nothing was found. So it's in a tribosome case, um, there is mass limit set, which is uh, this area here. In Atlas, there is a um, search for lepton flavor violation in Z decays. And lepton flavor is an accidental symmetry in the standard model. Actually, a lot of these theories violate uh, the symmetry. And um, the HT is a Z machine. So we have about 8 billion Zs produced in Atlas in run two. Um, that's a big data set. So we can actually do um, quite nice studies with that. 
um, you have a search for a Zex to email, um, where um, you search for an uptake of magazine mass in the email environment mass spectrum. Um, well, there's an ability to suppress a bit more the background to get a better result. Nothing was found, and the current limit on this is at 3 times 10 to the minus 7. And there is a search for um, the plural final states, so e, e or mu, uh, together with the tau. Those can decay either hydronically or electronically. Both channels are investigated. This is uh, for the hydronic channel, and that is a leptonic channel. Um, uh, in this analysis, they, find they went uh, from the neural net. So um, they trained neural nets to suppress the backgrounds, and in the end, also fitted the neural net output score. Um, and this is the first time that we have actually uh, improved our limits compared to what was measured at lab. And uh, in this uh, analysis, we have for the ETA channel, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 6, and 6.5 for the mute uh, channel. Then um, the last item um, is general searches, because in principle, we should not leave any stone unturned. We have a nice and large data set, um, but if we, um, if we define signal regions based on models, we might actually miss something. So uh, in both experiments, we have a, a general search, um, music in the case of CMS, they have an automatic automated search with final states with at least one lepton, and that gives them um, roughly 100 regions or so. Um, you see here the ones with the largest excesses, so all of them are rather small. I'm just showing here uh, for this excess here, the second bin, uh, an example that is the empty uh, distributions that they have in this bin, so there seems to be no excess there. That is, um, they call it the general multi lepton search, where they have final states with three or four leptons, and then they make differentiations whether or not they see uh, a Z in there. Um, this is the limits they obtain in the various uh, regions. Also, there, uh, no excess was found. Um, they have also evaluated their analysis against uh, the type 3 CSO that we've seen before and a WHR Shakes analysis in order. Um, yeah, to prove the point that they are doing uh, similarly well. In general, this is probably not meant to find something, but maybe if you see a bit of an excess somewhere, you can actually identify an interesting channel uh, for dedicated search. Um, with that, I'm concluding. So, yeah, we've seen a lot of Atlas and CMS results on exotics. Um, we're, we're doing these searches uh, for a multitude of models and, and final states. Our little boat has hopefully uh, moved a bit more closer to the coast. Um, we haven't seen that so far, but there are still a few full run uh, results um, that will come out soon. Um, otherwise, uh, we will be pushing the limits. Um, or um, what I also would like to mention is um, that both experiments have an ana analysis preservation um, components so that um, the data can also be reinterpreted in the future with different uh, signal models. And of course, the preservations for run three are in full swing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the very nice uh, summary of all the results. <laughs> Do you have results of any searches? for doubly charged bosons, either spin zero or spin one, going, for example, into same sign leptons? Mm, uh, there is, for instance, um, heavy neutral lepton switches. I think there should be also final states that have same sign, uh, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure. For sure there is something. I was like...
I, I can't uh, crank all the analysis. I have seen such results uh, up to about 800 GEP, but nothing uh, above that energy. For example, above 1,000 or 1,300 mm -hmm. so far in Atlas score of CMS. I, I can have a look if I if I find uh, recent results on this. I'm not 100% aware of all of these analysis, of course. <laughs> I think there are results available for this job in the common model, for example. Um, I don't know about the mass scales and so on, but I'm sure that there has been analysis published for the different peers for the stock uh, scale. So this exists, we have to look it up. But it's uh, it's done. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. What is that? Okay, that's really question there. No, it's not. Do you do on this? Uh... Okay, so it's not essential. It's quite an uh, an amazing accumulation of results. So it's difficult to really make one's way like but I, I just jotted something on the way i think you have um, at some point a contact interaction bs mm -hmm. into lepton pairs and uh, i was wondering whether you would not get better limits from lhcb or b factories on that because i assume this is a process b going to k uh lepton pair that they, they're actually measuring. Yeah, so um, I, I can't comment on, on LHCB, unfortunately. Um, it's probably also a bit of a question of, uh, it's already heavy, they might have a, a large opening angle and then maybe they are not in the acceptance of LHCB, but that's, that's just a hypothesis. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not aware of all of the results of LHCB. Of course, you are looking for a real process and they are looking for an indirect thing. No, but as an indirect process, you get a much better limit. I'm pretty sure this, the, the, the limit from indirect processes is, 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 is pretty high. So it, it would be nice to, con anyway, it would be nice to contrast it and to contrast the, the 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 conditions in which it's obtained and maybe i mean um I this was my, my, my neighbor wanted to ask something so this this result is very recently out so maybe um yeah. and actually will also react to this i don't know yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i i have a comment also to this result because that's you know i maybe you know the answer because my worry is when looking at such an option i worked uh, for for many years on, on contact interactions at Hera, uh, such type of contact interaction would immediately screw the all the PDF determinations. So, is it taken into account that if you assume such contact interaction, you have to put it also into the PDF extraction, and then check how it changes your expectations? Because assuming there is such a contact interactions and not uh, changing anything in, in, for example, systematics related in the PDF is clearly wrong. I can't say if they do this. Um, I will look up in the paper if, if they touch the PDFs for this. But maybe um, they assume it's a very, very small effect. That's my worry. Yeah. I mean, don't make it a criticism. Yeah, okay. There's a lot of material in all directions, and it's just a suggestion that since people will wonder, you, you put the, the, the corresponding information from other sources. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> This this box here is, is that there, there, it's a big jet and an S jet, isn't it? These are jets. Yes, so it's not about states, so LHCB wouldn't be able to do this. But we don't we don't do jets very well. If you have a three TV particle which causes GS, 
left on the table. Yeah, but they're high PC jets, right? Even show up in direct yeah. to Kenyon, you buy. Yeah, well, it's a forward for spectrometer, so it's, it's, it's designed to do bottom right. states. No, but I mean, if there is such interaction, but from that interaction, the theory, mm. it will provoke the degradation of D to K. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I accept that. We, yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I think we're, uh, so I think it's exactly that motivation, no? I think LHCB has seen an effect. And now the question is, is it a TV scale particle or is it something heavier? So here they're looking for a heavier interpretation and they're trying to see the same contact interaction at the energy front. It's just a, a way of looking at the same physics in an orthogonal way. But I'm sure it's motivated by the LHC. Yeah, anomaly. it definitely is. But you know, there are some models where the new physics particle is 30 TeV, and then it would look like a contact interaction still at the LHC, right? So, oh, here they're probing the content, they're probing lambda here, right? So, you're measuring coupling over scale. So, in some sense, you're not sensitive to the mass of the mediator. Okay, I think we probably have to close now before we all get kicked out. So thank you very much for the uh, and thank you to all the speakers today for excellent talks. I know, no, it's this good, good to provoke the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much.